Hello and welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. I'm C. Richard Gilchrist, your host, and we are just blessed today to have Mr. Al. And La Al, say your last name. Mina. Mina. Uh -huh. Al Mina is with us, and Al is, is a world traveler. This young man has been all over the world doing a number of things in the nonprofit arena. And I brought him on the show today to talk about what he's doing in the economic development within the nonprofit community. Al, welcome to the show. Thanks, Richard. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the time that you provided so that I can share with your audience a little bit about my activity, um, you know, pretty much all over the world in, in terms of capacity building and uh, economic development. So back in 2012, I completed my book. It's uh, titled Face Economics, which is um, the uh, uh, utilization of the social media platform in in order to advance economic development worldwide. Let me stop you right there and make sure people get that because I want you to go Google that word. It's called FACE. Spell it for them. FACE Economics is spelled F-A-C-E-C-O-N-O-M-I-C-S. FACE Economics. Right. Uh -huh. All right. So now, FACE Economics in the form of social media. Yeah, it's a fairly new concept and it's never been done ever in human history and therefore we're exploring the resources that the social media platform provides, you know, not just uh, in, in the business aspect of, of development, but also in capacity building for nonprofit organizations. Um, initially, when, when I got involved in economic development, I was um, fortunate enough to represent our country uh, in Romania as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer. And a lot of my engagement back then was uh, helping uh, NGOs and, and organizations uh, within Eastern Europe to help them build capacity. So I would advise and consult with decision makers on developing their format in terms of sustainability, management you know, of their finances, and engaging donors and sponsors. Uh, but at that time, social media was just you know kind of becoming a, a phenomenon within the U.S. market. So it wasn't heavily, you know, being utilized overseas. So I was able to engage uh, the nonprofit as well as the business communities in Eastern Europe to consider using their social media platform in order to build capacity, attract investment, and also learn off of do-it-yourself type of engagements. That's excellent. So now when you got back to the United States, mm -hmm. you seen that they were having the same issues. Right, absolutely. Uh, prior to me joining the U.S. Peace Corps, I was uh, engaged in attracting investment into the state of Virginia. I was under the VEDP working uh, for an um, international trade manager, um, which the VEDP was a, a function of the under the governor's office to attract investment and also support um, Virginia-based companies to go and, and export overseas with maybe goods and services. So I had a little bit of experience in terms of, you know, FDI and, and import-export. So when I got back to the U.S., I ended up working for the World Bank Group, and I decided that, you know, there are pockets within the U.S. communities that are still underdeveloped, and I wanted to come back here and, and utilize my experience that I've gained overseas in capacity building and in economic development to support our country's initiative in developing capacity within the underserved communities as well as NGO sectors and uh, emerging markets within our country because we are a country that is developed but we also will have uh, pockets within our communities that are developing emerging communities that need help in terms of attracting investment, job creation, uh, capacity building and education. And I believe that this is my time to help our country and, and our community and, and our population to build capacity in order for us to compete worldwide. So give us an example of some of the things that you've done here in the United States that speak to this whole nonprofit organizations in the area. When I was in college, I was um, uh, fortunate enough to work with Two nonprofit groups, the uh, uh, Lynchburg Hispanic Alliance, and uh, as well as the International Community of, uh, House, uh, both are uh, the, geared towards uh, providing uh, service to uh, new entrants into the country, immigrants that are coming in from South America and parts of Asia. So we would basically, you know, uh, 
fundraise throughout the community and engage the community through cultural interactions and you know diversifications of activities for that nonprofit in order for us to educate the population about you know the, the flight of you know immigrants within the central Virginia region. So I was heavily vested in, in developing that initiative as a board member of that organization. And so, you know, that kind of, you know, developed me and, and developed my desire to want to continue on and join, I and later joined the Peace Corps. All right. So now we have heard about some of the, the book that you wrote. Say what specifically you think uh, social media can do in face economics. Right, and the face economics concept is relatively new. Um, when I started writing the book, I was still in college back then. To be honest, I was uh, the you know founder and president of the International Business Council at Liberty University, and predominantly of what I would use my social media platform for is basically recruit members to join my club. Uh, but at that time, social media was heavily vested in terms of you know, just socializing. It was a platform for younger folks to, you know, get to know other people and, and interact with them uh, through that, you know, medium. But I was utilizing my social media platform in order to engage uh, the campus community to want to learn about international trade, economic development, foreign direct investment. I was, you know, pretty boring when I was in college. That doesn't sound boring to me. That <laughs> sounds like the beginning of Facebook. And, and <laughs> right, and and the the you know state got a hold of me because the local newspaper wrote about me and they said, okay, we would like to bring you in as an intern for the DDP Virginia Economic Development Partnership. So I was, you know, working under an international trade manager. And that kind of, you know, later evolved into what face economics as we know it today, which is the use of the social media platform to engage in, you know, a, a much more fruitful uh, endeavor in terms of capacity building, economic development, and you know, developing an opportunity for the less fortunate within any society that is utilizing it because there's a way for them to share their ideas and, and, and you know, uh, also engage in capacity building themselves. They can learn on the spot via either YouTube or whatever medium, social media they use uh, to, to build capacity, capacity. So I think this is the time for anyone, uh, not just in, in developed countries, but developing countries to take advantage of this really, really neat medium, and it's just one of, uh, uh, it's a platform that's never been utilized ever, you know, in human history. So those people who are running nonprofit organizations out there, like who's going to try to help uh, stop uh, domestic violence, those people who are interested in doing something with the homeless, those folks who are interested in developing their community, social media has some uh place in what you're doing in terms of how you're reaching people how you're building uh getting staff folks to actually start to work with you and how to raise money to do the things that you're doing and here's a book that's already written that says here's a method of how you do that now you've written a couple other books talk about this one that has that caught my attention, right. and that was this one with the barbecue sauce. Now, right, talk about right. that. Right, and, and the the tenets and the concept behind barbecue markets is, is fairly, you know, robust. Um, I started doing research on how economic engines throughout Europe and the U.S. is being used um, in terms of, you know, meeting their objectives. Uh, may it be, you know, the the activity of a, a regular chamber of commerce, regional or national chamber of commerce, or economic development institutions that are trying to attract foreign direct investment. And throughout the years, uh, the three year time that I was engaged in this market uh, research, I started cold calling uh, various institutions throughout Europe. I've contacted over 28 countries in the European Union and seven countries outside of the European Union and then all 50 states in our country I've uh, contacted various regional economic development as well as government governor institution that are heavily vested in economic development and attracted foreign direct investment from overseas as well as um, their, their their state uh, chamber of commerce. And so upon getting all the resources and data that I wanted in order to create a, a, you know a, a platform and a convincing uh, you know subject, um, 
after I completed that, I drafted the book Barbecue Markets, uh, which is the secret economic sauce behind it is basically social media use. Oh, wow. Uh, the okay. reason being is because a lot of these institutions, predominantly of them, have never really utilized their social media, you know, capacity up until maybe 10, 15 years ago when, you know, people are starting to kind of warm up to the use of the social media platform. But at that time, you know, there were previous books that were written on, you know, the nature of, of the social media platform, but there wasn't enough written about the development and economic development capacity involved that is uh, associated through social media that people can utilize and, and go out there and in, introduce their, their uh, business or learn how to develop a startup through, you know, do-it-yourself type of activity uh, or create a, a, develop a skill altogether through, you know, social media. So there's a, a new segment in, in our economy now that is predominantly entrepreneur in spirit, but it also uh, you know, it, it, entrepreneurial in spirit, but it, it's predominantly uh, driven by capacity building that is being you, you know, by through the utilization of social media. You know, that's so interesting. And you're listening to the Nonprofit Exchange, and I'm your host, C. Richard Gilchrist. And basically, what, what, what our guest is talking about today is really how do we actually get nonprofit organizations out to the public so that they understand what you're doing how you're doing it and who you're doing it for. Social media is an answer to I, part of that dilemma of nonprofits not having, one, the money to raise to actually keep their organization going. Secondly, the number of people who are standing by helping you. And to look at what it is that we're trying to do in terms of longevity, in terms of what we're trying to do to help people. In other words, Let's, let's talk about these homeless people. If we were talking about homeless people in the next 10 years, how are we going to help homeless people? We can use social media as a, a method of, one, getting to, uh, to the homeless people, and secondly, to sustain that activity that is to help homeless people. So I thought that was interesting. Now, the sauce you say that's in that book is what kind of sauce? You know, the, the sauce would entail the social media, you know, capacity, capacity building that is now being introduced into various markets. We have a market in America that can, you know, take advantage of the social media platform if we know how to use it, if we educate our population on how to consistently, you know, help it evolve. Um, and and the, I think the nonprofit sector would be, a, you know, a, a target uh, sector for you know social media capacity building because predominantly of the social media environment uh, are free you know these are all generated by organization that utilizes you know interaction through you know social interaction throughout the communities you know that is uh, predominantly underdeveloped or doesn't have a whole lot of, of funds in order for them to pay for marketing or website design or any form of business engagements that, you know, a, a, a nonprofit organization would need in order for them to attract funding. So, so the real issue is who's helping each of the nonprofit organizations to actually engage in social media. So that means if you're the person that wants to deliver the service at your nonprofit organization, you may not be the person to get on Facebook and actually set up a crowdfunding right. uh, program on Facebook. You may need to go get a board member or go to a university and get a student who's actually majoring in that field sure. to come out and do that for you. See, we in nonprofits try to do everything. When we can't do everything, we need to make sure that we can go and get somebody to do that type of work. So now, Al, give them your phone number and your uh, website information so that if somebody here wants to follow up on the conversation and say, okay, Al, come help us you know, develop a way to get this social media piece as a part of our nonprofit. Right. Uh, I think I'll go ahead and give you my email address instead of my phone number, uh, just because I don't always you know, necessarily pick up my phone if I don't recognize the number. Uh, but if you need to get a hold of me, the email address to use is info, I-N-F-O, at pgcgroup.us. Again, that is info, 
at pgcgroup.us. And again, the name of the book is Face Economics, and it's spelled F-A-C-E-C-O-N-O-M-I-C-S. And, you know, I'd be delighted to speak with you if you have any questions or suggestions in, in order for us to develop capacity and, and collaborate. So now, the rest of the, this program is going to be based around now Al's uh, recommendations for nonprofits. Al, what are you recommending for nonprofits on um, what they should do to try to develop the capacity, number one? And two, what are your recommendations about the future of nonprofits in this area? Uh, I believe the nonprofit sector is uh, an organization driven or that is that heavily relies on educating the population on their the services that they provide. And I think it's important that nonprofits, you know, throughout you know the country continue to develop you know material that could help facilitate that connection. Um, and that's extremely, you know, important in developing a social media platform because you have to constantly produce content uh, and upload it onto your social media platform so that people can see that you're heavily vested in, in what you're doing and also trying to uh, reach out to people that might not necessarily be interested in what you're doing because, you know, there's a, a, a unique uh, dimension to social media. The social media platform is not just for the, your target audience. It also captures the attention of those people that have never been educated, uh, you know, regarding a specific objective or, or su subject, topic, whatever. And I think that's something that is so unique about the social media platform. And I was just in Romania a, a few months ago, and one thing that I really noticed, you know, that struck me as a very, very interesting um, a very interesting uh, observation was that people, you know, elderly that are in their 70s to, uh, on up to their 80s are not joining the social media platform because they want to get access to the world. They want to know what's going on around the world through social media. And because of the social media platform and, and through that engagement through social media, you know, so social media, these uh, elderly were learning how to preserve, you know, their, their, their fruits, they were preserving you know, stuff that they were predominantly doing, you know, at a much more archaic, you know, uh, you know, engagement. So they're learning, you know, and they're leapfrogging on capacity, you know, be because of the social media platform. And I think that's going to be relevant also for the nonprofit community. They can build capacity to learning, in, you know, within that environment, the social media environment. And I think they should explore that more. Uh, rather than just you know drafting you know grants or applying for funding, uh, I think it's it's going to be in their best interest moving forward that they're educating the community that they want to target as well as communities that they might not be aware of their function or their objectives. You know that's a really important point because a lot of times we're so bent on doing the service that we don't talk about uh, telling people why we're doing that service and who's affected by the service and what right. some of the outcomes have been as a result of providing that service. Sure. So Al's given us a, a, a good look into the future that we need to figure out ways to do that as a nonprofit organization. So yeah. now, again, I caution nonprofit organizations out there, don't you try doing this and not do the service. Get somebody else, a board member, a social organization, partner up with somebody and have them tell the story. Have them, you know, go out and produce the content because that's not something that you're Absolutely. used to doing. You're not used to producing the right. content. So the content is really the word for the story about what you're doing. That's the content that they're talking about. Sometimes we get hung up on language and words. I just got a good lecture about words and changing our language today. So that, let's change the language. You're trying to make sure that people understand what you're doing in your nonprofit organization. Right, and uh, you're absolutely correct, you know, because the social media platform is an evolution of our capacity as humans, as, as, uh, as thinkers, and, and the social media 
platform in itself is one of the greatest experiments on human history, in my opinion. And you, you were right on the dot when you said that we learn, need to learn new languages and evolve in terms of how we you know, adapt into changes in our communities and countries. Um, and this also would you know, basically affect uh, the nonprofit sector because you know, majority of nonprofit organizations are operating based on goodwill and they, they're doing it because you know, they see the need for a service that, that you know, is not readily available within a community. And I think uh, the social media platform was developed because that wasn't available, you know, 30, 45 years ago. Exactly. So there was a need for people to in interact and connect. And therefore, you know, uh, a, a perfect example would be Facebook. You know, Facebook was developed in, in Harvard because um, they wanted to connect people, students, and be able to interact through that social media platform. And I think the evolution of mankind and the story of humanity is perfectly encapsulated through our engagement on social media because it shows us that we're not that different right. as, as people. We're all you know connected and we're all have the same hopes, desires, and dreams. Uh, but that wasn't readily readily available you know previously. And I think that this is one of, one of the reasons why we have so much conflicts among people, among you know uh, countries and and organization and government. And, and recently, I've just come across you know. Uh, various uh, government entities around the world using social media for public diplomacy. So this is something that we're now engaged in and it's never happened in mankind. This is very, very new to us. We're test driving it, but I think so far uh, we would excel as a, as a population. You know, um, we, we are extremely excited and very optimistic uh, as, a, as people, uh, you know, no matter what background you're from, we're optimistic about you know, the capacity and the evolution of our, you know, story, our journey as humans because of social media. Because you know, at least now, you know, there's a way for us to interpret our engagement, uh, you know, through uh, what we learn about our friends, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters uh, that we've never learned about that previously. Just because we're on social media and they're a part of our social media platform, we learned that you know our uncle is interested in, in singing, and our aunts are interested in, in you know sewing you know right. shirts and linens, and, and so all these stuff have never been that you know readily available. You know there there are people you know within their families that don't know that you know their their brother is interested in you know doing this DJing thing. Right. You know up until they saw it on social media. So we're uncovering the mysteries of humankind. We're uncovering the mysteries of who we are as people and, and the desire of our generation as well as your generation to link us all together and say, okay, you know what, we're really not all that different. And, and, you know, and the other big thing about that is we can look at the future and actually say, we want this to happen in the future and now have a, a way of actually monitoring how we get there. Absolutely. That is just important. If somebody told me right now, if there's an organization out there saying, okay, within the next five years, I want to have a building. Mm -hmm. And somebody right now has a building available, that building could actually be there within less than five years, sure. less than five minutes, because somebody now knows that this organization needs a building, right. and now they can take that building and actually give it to them under... A 501c3 laws under the fact that they can make a donation to something like that and do it sure. just because social media told them right. that that's available and that's what people wanted at the time. Absolutely. Yeah, and just to add on that, I think, um, you know, the resources that we are now able to, you know, penetrate because of our knowledge you know, are, we are now in, a, in a, an era that we are knowledge driven and resource capacity building oriented yes. compared to back in the days before you know the age of discovery where you know people were isolated there were communities uh, around the world that were struggling but they never had a chance to get access to information and there are, that's what you know you know kept people from moving forward social mobility in various countries around the world because they were hindered or, or information was not readily available, they did not know how to build capacity. Today, emerging markets, frontier markets around the world 
have the same resources that we now have in our country, developed country like the U.S., and they're building, you know, buildings with 3D printing. Yes. And resources, you know, CAD design, and all of these technological advancement that people around the world are utilizing, and therefore we as, you know, the pioneers here in America right. should also consider that kind of approach to what we created and what we've given to the world. And that's the reason why I'm really employing the nonprofit community through this program and through others to not let anything stop you now from actually asking and showing people why you're doing what you're doing. See, if you ask somebody what it is that you want, but you have to show them why you're doing this and what gap it's fitting in and how that gap is actually going to be closed if you help with that. I mean, sure. if somebody would have told you right now that we're going to eradicate, we're going to stop completely the word ghetto from even being in the English language because sure. there's going to be no more people who are, quote, poor. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to do that? Because we're going to create industries that are going to actually eradicate ghettos oh, yeah. so that everybody oh, yeah. in America, everybody who's in some kind of uh, what they call low-income community sure. is now going to have money because they're going to raise that money through social media. Oh, they're going to raise that money through creating industries. I mean, just think about every young person who learns how to uh, go out and actually start to uh, what they call uh, code mm -hmm. so that they sure. now are the ones who are writing the code that goes on the Internet. That means that every child that you know would be making a $95,000 income within the next five years because they learned how to actually code what you now see on your on your phone, right. on your Absolutely. television set, on your computer, sure. because that's the way, the new industry of the future. Yeah. So these are the kind of things that I, I know that nonprofits have the capacity already to think about doing and now they have the access to actually getting it done absolutely and you got it right on again you're one smart dude man and, and this is what it is it's thinking outside the box and you just exactly you know showed a perfect example of how to think outside the box our generation and your generation are now uniting in order for us to leave the next generation a much more favorable country a much more desirable environment for people to want to be a part of and, and we're you know laying the you know the, the tracks for the next generation to be able to utilize this new fourth gener fourth you know industrial revolution platform yes that has never been used by any society worldwide you've been listening to the nonprofit exchange I'm C Richard Gilchrist your host and we've had Al and Al, your last name again is Mina. Mina. Al, Mina. Uh -huh. Al Mina has been with us today, and it's been important for you to understand that Al has been all over the world, not just the United States. He's been all over the world. He's written a couple of books. He's given us the blueprint for us to start looking at a blueprint for the future. You know, the young person that you're talking to today has no interest in the past. They are looking towards the future. And in order to teach them about the past, you got to start dealing with their future. And I think it's an important aspect of nonprofit organizations to reach out to people like Al and reach out to the internet and all the other things. We need to stop this foolishness about, I'm getting off of Facebook. Start using Facebook as a positive means Absolutely. of interaction Absolutely. with others and to get what you want done. All this uh, negative publicity about the internet that's just to keep you from doing what you need to do to build for your build for your future. Uh, we have a few minutes left, and I'm gonna let uh, Al talk about his number and his uh, 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 email address so that you can reach him. Yes, Al? please uh, feel free to send me an email um, at info at pgcgroup.us. Again, that's info i n f o at pgcgroup one word dot us. And look up FACE Economics, that's spelled F-A-C-E-C-O-N-O-M-I-C-S. 
and let's uh, you know talk and I, I look forward to hearing back from you and giving you know how learning about your feedback on this uh, specific broadcast uh, and let's let's make it happen guys this is America's time to grow and grow and keep on growing you're listening to the nonprofit exchange I'm your host C Richard Gilchrist and I want to thank you for listening today, but I want you to do more than listen today. I want you to get a pencil and piece of paper, write down what you've just heard about here at the Nonprofit Exchange, and go out there and get it done. It is important for the young people of our future, for adults who listen to programs like this, to start designing the future for our young people. And the only way you can design that future now is start looking at things out of the box, from the, from the pulpit to the alleyway we have got to stop looking at things negatively and look at things positively you're listening to the nonprofit exchange here at nsu thank you for